Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, thank you for coming. I'm surprised to see these uh, many people, you know, on 11 a.m. on Saturday to listen to Dark Matter. So what I'm trying to do, I try to make the presentation such that you don't feel that you wasted your Saturday. But it's also a commencement. <laughs> it's, also, <laughs> it's also a commencement, and I, and I feel that you had uh, lots of trouble <laughs> parking. As I did. Yes. Okay, so... So the title of my talk is From Infinitesimal to Infinity and Search for Dark Matter. Uh, okay, infinitesimal and infinity. Both of them are the concepts that don't exist really, but I just try to exaggerate because we have problems at both scales in the universe in our, in our physics, in our understanding of the, of the nature of physics. And at the large scales of the scale of 2 to 10 to 18 kilometers, 100 billion astronomy, um, uh, astronomic units, uh, which is the distance between basically Sun and the Earth, and masses of the order of 200 billion times the mass of the Sun. This is the scale we are talking about, the scale of a galaxy, for example. We have problems at the very small scales, too, in our understanding of the physics of the very so small scales, like the size of 10 to minus 17 centimeters. Just to tell you, the size of an atom is 10 to minus 8 centimeter times the uh, size of a nucleus is about 10 to minus 13 centimeters. So, we go down, and but this is, despite all the work and you know, the, the triumphs of physics that already that we understand in between the two scales is very interesting. Okay, but now we are reaching to the frontiers, so that's where the problem comes. Uh, so masses of the order of n minus 32 grams. Now, the question is if we can connect these two extremes, two extreme scales, and if our misunderstanding or uh, lack of understanding of the nature of the fundamental physics behind uh, 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 these two scales, if they are somehow related. And somehow the universe provides that relation, that connection is provided by the universe itself. And the reason is that we know that universe is not a steady, uh, stable universe. You know, we know that it's evolving, it's expanding. And nowadays the evidences for the Big Bang theory for the fact that the universe started from a point and expanded to the observable universe of today is abundant. It is very hard actually to find another uh, explanation of, uh, for our observations. So if the universe started from one point, you know, the huge universe that we are uh, seeing, if it started at some point at very small volume, that means that all the energy and mass of the universe was concentrated in a very small region. And imagine all the energy concentrated in a small region, you would you know, intuitively think that that means that maybe the energy, the average energy of the universe much, was much higher. The average energy of the, of the components of the system basically defines temperature. Okay? So that means that the temperature was higher. In particle physics and in, um, uh, in astrophysics, the, the energy, distance, and temperature, all these parameters are somehow related. Like when I speak about very high energies, that's even TV about very short distances, because they need to have high energy for a proton, for example, to see another proton, to get close to the proton. So, if the universe started from one point, its temperature was very high. That means that it was so high that you couldn't even produce atoms. Don't even think about structures, like stars, galaxies. You couldn't even produce uh, nucleus, even nuclei. That means that even the quarks, even the constituents of the nucleon, were free. That is, they forming a plasma and all interacting together. They are sort of in equilibrium. So the physics at that very early universe is basically particle physics. The physics of infinitism. Now, is there any footprint from that physics to our observable universe today? That's what we believe. Okay. So we believe that what happened at that early universe has a footprint to the universe that we observe today. And one of the things is uh, that what we don't understand here, maybe we can track back to what physics was there. So that's what I meant connecting the infinitesimal to infinity, and I'm going to elaborate a bit more what, what I mean. Now, let's go to the problems. What are the problems we have? Let's start with the large scale. Uh, and in order to understand large scale, the first thing you should understand is the gravity. By the way, I, I tried to make the presentation, I was asked to make the presentation very, you know, level. <laughs> but if, if it's not too detailed, don't, don't worry. You can interrupt me anytime and ask for more details, or if, you know, some of the things I'm explaining are not <coughs> understandable, just ask me. I have no problem with that, okay? So, let's start with the uh, gravity. The genius thought of Newton, 300, 
more than 300 years ago, who thought that, you know, this famous story that, you know, a falling apple, that means uh, there's a force that's pulling the apple toward the earth, is the same force that holds the celestial objects uh, in, the, in the universe. Okay, so that was a genius thought, actually, because what happens is that <coughs> using the same uh, equations on the earth, you can basically, you, you, the, the whole idea that, you know, the, the celestial objects are by some divine force, they are pulled together, it's, it's gone. You can, you can calculate, you can make precision. Okay, so, and also, based on the dynamic that he himself invented, he could find a, a formula, an equation between the force and the masses and the distance between the two objects. Okay, so he finds that the, that the force is proportional to the mass of the two objects and uh, inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Okay, so that's important because that means that farther the objects are, less the force, and therefore they go slower. Similar to the, this um, the apple, uh, who will the hammer throwing. Okay, so if you have stronger muscles, that means you have more force, you can uh, um, turn the hammer uh, faster and faster and therefore throw it farther and farther. That means that faster they go, more force is in the center. Okay, and that means more mass in the center. That means, for example, if our sun was 10 times heavier than what we have now, our, the, 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 the Earth should have um, uh, orbit. 10 times past. Okay? So that's what we know. And see, how does it work at the scale of our solar system? If I, based on the mass of, the, uh, of this uh, star, uh, uh, our own star, Sun, which I can estimate, I can estimate what would be the, velocity, the orbital velocity of uh, planets in the solar system. And it matches perfectly fine with, the, with, the, with what we expect on this curve. And so you say, that's it, that's a proof. So the, uh, the uh, gravitation, uh, uh, based on Newtonian theory, is totally complete, it's fine. Now, let me go to the a bit larger structures. It's not a bit larger structures. It's about 200 billion suns, like a galaxy, a spiral galaxy, like our own Milky Way. Okay? Or going to the even larger structures, like a clusters of galaxies. Thousands of the galaxies in cluster, or going into the universe, you know, the entire, you know, uh, universe, and this is an estimate of the number of stars by one of the astronomers, of the number of stars that are in, in the universe, and this is an image of the early universe, basically, is a picture of the universe that's very er uh, early ages, what we call the cosmic microwave background, fossil background, from the uh, time where the, the, the uh, atoms start to form, and uh, the universe become a pack. At these scales, is the Newtonian gravity uh, working? Or our predictions, our observations are the same? So, about you know, 1970s, uh, Vera Rubin found that looking at the, uh, at the spiral, uh, spiral galaxies, she looks and tries to find uh, velocity, orbital velocity of the stars and gas. Uh, in, in these uh, galaxies and could estimate what is the amount of mass based on the luminosity, that means the amount of light that you're observing from the galaxy, and she could estimate what would be, if the entire mass was uh, uh, emitting light or interacting with light, what would be the orbital velocity. So you see, that's the prediction. At the beginning, the velocities increase because the mass, total mass increases, so an, an object which is here sees much bigger mass, okay? You integrate the mass. But at some point, the luminosity goes away. That means that mass should become smaller and smaller. So her prediction is that the, similar to our solar system, the orbital velocity should drop. Okay? But this is what she observes. Okay? So what is it? Is that uh, a problem with the gravity, with the R theory of gravity? Or could there be some matter that doesn't interact with light? Where comes the name to so does the eventually drop off? Sorry? So does that curve eventually drop off? It's, yes, at very large distance. But you don't see any matter at large distances. No, basically it continues if you really want. Because, okay, if you wait just two slides, I will tell you why it doesn't drop. Okay. Uh, this one drops, but this is a prediction. Uh, okay, so this is a matter, it doesn't emit light, but 
it is matter because it has gravitational effect. So every time you have a mass or matter, you have a gravitation. It's not like an electromagnetic force that you need to have a charge. Mass we call gravity. Okay? So if it's a matter, it doesn't emit light. It doesn't interact with light, that's why we call it dark, dark matter. Okay? The evidence doesn't stop here. In fact, the first observation, explanation, or suggestion for dark matter started about 1934. Fritz Zwicky from Caltech, he looked at the velocity distribution of the galaxies in the cluster of galaxies, and what he finds is that in order to explain the, their, uh, their velocity distribution, he needs to have 10 times more mass than what he's observed uh, by, by the light emitted by, uh, by, uh, from those clusters. And that was the very first evidence. And it is interesting that you go to larger and larger scales, you have more evidence for dark matter. Now, let's go to the universe. This is actually an animation uh, based on a simulation that shows how the universe evolved from very early ages. Let me start from over. Uh, very ages, uh, very, uh, very early ages, where the, the thing was like a scene of particles, and then the structures start to form. In order to make it similar, to our observation, our observable universe, you need to introduce dark matter, otherwise it doesn't work. Your structure doesn't form as they form now. This is all distribution of the dark matter. It's a simulation from Max Planck Institute in Germany. I just remove that expansion and I get another one. This is again uh, a formation of galaxies and this is our observation from LSSD uh, telescope. We look at the structure and the distribution of structure of the universe. So parameter Z that's rattling down there from the camera. It's, uh, it's actually a redshift. Uh, farther you look, in, in the expanded universe, mm -hmm. farther you look, uh, earlier time you're looking at, basically. Z is basically the redshift, and redshift is... Okay, imagine that, um, in order to understand expansion, it's much easier if you think two-dimensional. Okay, imagine that you're sitting on the sphere, on the, on the, on the surface of balloons, okay, and the balloon is expanding. You can imagine, even, even if the velocity expansion of the balloon is, uh, is the same thing, if you are sitting on two points, okay, the, the, the speed at which you are getting farther from each other increases if you, you are at farther distances. Okay? That means, and there is this effect in physics, Doppler effect, and uh, this is basically if you are, the, the, the frequency of light or anything like, like a sound varies based on the uh, relative velocity between you and the, uh, and the emitter, okay? Like you are in the highway, you hear you know, the, the, the cars, the, you know, that this is a frequency uh, changing. And this is the same thing. And this frequency change is proportional to, uh, to velocity. Uh, so when I say Z bigger, that means it goes faster, okay? That means it's farther from us. Or because the universe is expanding, it's earlier in the universe. So all of them are related. Earlier universe, higher redshift, and a larger distance from us. Okay, so that matches. These are our simulations. The other thing, so now you could say that maybe there's a problem with the gravity, you know, our, our theory of gravity. All these evidences may point to the fact that we don't understand what, how the gravity works. Maybe there's another field in the world that we don't know of. An example, one of the things which was very interesting is when two clusters of galaxies, they collide to each other. They go through each other. Here I'm showing a result of simulation. Of course we are not seeing that in real time because this happens over 100 million years, this collection. But this is a simulation and this is what you observe after, after the collision is finished, after the two clusters just go through each other. Okay? And this is the distribution of matter. What you find here, there is a part of the mass that you can observe by different techniques, what we call lensing techniques, in, uh, based on the you know, general theory of relativity by Albert Einstein. Uh, if the light passes next to a large mass, it bends. Okay? So basically it acts like a lens. You can look at this region and look at the light emitted from the farther galaxies and then see how they, how they deflect. Okay? And you can estimate how much mass is there. That's how you estimate there. This part is actually luminous matter. This is the part that you see and it is interesting that the luminous part says after collision, it's like they hold together and the non-interacting part, the dark matter part, it just goes away. And the ratio is very similar to the standard you know, and the 5 to 1 that we, that we are expecting from dark matter uh, components of the universe. That is very interesting. So that means that really it seems that there is something. You know, there is a matter. There is not a problem with that. There is something that is missing in our 
sampling in our observation. So that's a bullet cluster, and uh, and so basically it tells us you know the stars. Oh, let me go to the chart to the chart of the universe. So, so if uh, if if the universe was a part, how much we understand about it? About seventy percent of it is dark energy. Don't ask me. It's even more mysterious than dark matter. Okay. So if you have questions, I can answer later at, at the end of the talk. Twenty-five percent is dark matter. The rest is the is the matter that we know. So it's a big confession of a physicist. <laughs> so we don't understand. But at least we know that we don't know. So it's better than we don't know. So we went very far together. <laughs> so these are the matter. This is the part of the universe that we understand. So my project is to understand, to decipher actually, what is the nature of this dark matter, if it is indeed a matter. What is its nature? Now, with this introduction to the problems at the large scales, let's go to the small scales, infinite small, small scales. A lot of progress, a lot of success in particle physics. And particle physics is basically the physics describes, you know, the, the matter that you know surrounding us, the building blocks, the fundamental building blocks of matter. And the standard model of particles, which was developed in the last 30, 40 years, is uh, has some elementary particles that are listed here. Uh, three generations of particles, quarks and leptons, and the forces by um, by bosons that are interacting between them, that carry the force between the matter, uh, between these particles. So, in order to detect these particles, you use very large detectors, and there was a lot of predictions. The standard model is seemed to be very successful in predicting things, and uh, and very recently you saw uh, uh, the result from Higgs discovery. Higgs boson was one of the last particles from standard model that was discovered. And just you know, a year ago, uh, the first science of the Higgs boson came out. So that was a big discovery. So sounds like very good. But the problem is that it's incomplete. Standard model is internal. It has internal problems. Like, for example, it cannot predict the mass of the Higgs. It, it can predict, sort of. It can be normalized. It. The problem is that if you want to do the correction, radiative correction, correction, which is internal to the quantum field theory uh, at this level, the, the physics at, the, at these high energies, the masses of the the mass of Higgs will tend to go to infinity. Okay, so that's the inconsistency in the theory. So it also doesn't explain why there is such a difference between the forces in nature. Like, give me a break here. Gravity 10 to minus 39 compared to to electromagnetic, which is you know, 1 over 30, 137. So there's a huge difference between the forces in nature. Why? I always give an example, like in order to understand what is the difference, you know, in the scale of the forces. Just when you rub, you know, a balloon on your head and you hold it, you know, your 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 basically your hand is fighting against the mass of the entire earth. Okay, so <laughs> that's the difference in the scale of the uh, you know the, the coupling. It doesn't explain that. It doesn't explain why the, we have so different masses, particles have so different masses, although there is this question of coupling to the Higgs field, but the Higgs field itself has problems. Also, it doesn't explain, it doesn't have a natural way to explain how, how to all the forces are joined together and unified at a very early universe, which is something that we need, because at the very early universe, we think that every forces were basically the same. And then as the universe cools down, the things decouple from each other or um, and break. Uh, and branch into different forces. So gravity at 10 to 32. And here again, you see the temperature scale and the time scale. And I didn't put the distance scale, but they are all the same. Okay, they are all the same. So this is a very early universe, and this is the universe we are seeing today with 2.9 Kelvin, uh, 2.7 Kelvin, actually. Good question. Why do you think that? Why do you think the forces were different? The very first evidence is the weak forces and electromagnetic forces, we know that they are. You know, because the prediction of unification, uh, uh, it has you know, some, some work done. The predictions came out, like you know, the particles that come out of that uh, prediction, they were observed, and there's a natural way to explain why the weak forces. And also, uh, the fact that at the very early universe, it is very difficult. It's a first, it's a, you know, you, you can call it a, 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 a case. But if you think about the universe, which was very early ages, it is hard to uh, interpret physics without having a unified uh, uh, gauge that was, you know. Uh, it, but it is just a question, maybe it's, a, it's an assumption that you may say, no, the physics at the very beginning was very different. But thinking about universe starting from one point, you know, uh, make you think 
there. And also having the observation of electromagnetic and big forces, which are very different forces by nature, they are unified at high energy. To make you think that all the forces that come from there are unified. So, let me see if I'm understanding this, Church. Does that mean before 10 to the minus 10 seconds after the Big Bang, the weak force didn't exist? And then it started to exist and it sort of changed for a while and yes. then stabilized? Uh, it branches out, yes. So, it is basically, uh, no, it's basically it just branches out. Of, now, how, what is dynamic of going out is just energy. You know, how much, uh, how much, because the universe is not totally uniform, the uh, energy distribution. Okay, so you may have uh, regions where, it, you know, uh, you have the unified, non unified. That, that depends very much on how many bosons are, are created or annihilated. My question was what can we actually measure? I mean, you've got 10 to the minus 30. Yes. Can we register such distinction? If, if you build, if you, it there it's, it's calculation. You say that, uh, 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 but, but 10 to minus 35 seconds is after Big Bang. Of, yes, of your, I, but, right, so that's a theoretical. Yes, absolutely. What, what, what can we measure uh, today? Today, beyond seconds. The problem is that beyond the, the, uh, the uh, uh, 10 to 3 Kelvin, we don't have all the universe was open before that. So, so we don't. We just predict that in order to explain the fluctuations on the cosmic microwave background, it's a temperature of 10,000 10, Kelvin, okay, 24, very far from there. Okay. In order to understand those fluctuations, you need to have some distribution or an evolution beforehand, which gets yeah, there. And some, I mean, some but obviously, you don't observe anything. Okay, so standard model doesn't have anything to explain that. Well, you know, as you said, maybe it's the whole picture is wrong. <laughs> that maybe they are not uniform. They start very distinct, the, the forces. But, you know, I as a physicist, I do like it. <laughs> to have it. And if I don't, then, you know, evidences are. So, there are many extensions to uh, standard model, uh, which include basically standard model in, in them, more general theories. And one of them is supersymmetry that predicts for every particle in standard model particle there is a partner, okay? And uh, in uh, and at some point this symmetry between uh, this symmetry was broken, you know, at a very early universe, and it was we were left with these particles. But the lightest of these particles, Susie, uh, particles might be a stable particle. Okay, the lightest because if there is a parity, if there is a symmetry that we can't break then the lightest particle will be um, uh, stable because it, it can no more decay to any standard model particle. So that will remain there. Is that the candidate? Maybe. It is very interesting. How are the um, SUSY particles different from the standard? They are much more massive. And they couple uh, at a big scale, basically. We, we have observed any of those like no. the large no. So isn't that a problem? I'm getting there. I'm getting to say, to say to give you some bad news at the end, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I don't even do Susie. I don't even believe in Susie. What I'm doing now, I'm saying that imagine at the Big Bang, very early in the universe, okay, some particles were produced that I don't know of, that I haven't detected yet, okay, and those particles are dark matter, okay. Let's say there are some particles that I don't know of, the generic class of particles that I don't know of. But they were produced at a very early universe, uh, right after Big Bang. Okay, and I want to follow its dy the dynamic or the distribution of these particles. Okay, and here I'm showing this. Uh, this is a density versus time, basically. Okay. At the beginning, everything is in equilibrium. The soup, okay, the plasma I was talking about. As the universe expands, very similar to when you spray something, you feel that it's colder. You know, the universe becomes to cool off. As it cools down, the energies go down. Remember now the Einstein equivalence uh, uh, equation, E equals mc squared. Lo smaller E is harder to produce mass of particle. Uh, that is to say, the energy goes down, the production of those particles drop. Their density will drop. The only thing that is remaining is that these particles see each other, again Einstein's equation, they annihilate into energy. Okay? mc squared. Now, 
they, it can't go forever because at some point they, these guys don't uh, don't see each other anymore. The universe is expanding. Okay. In order to have the relic density that we are seeing to explain the relic density of the dark matter, which is eighty percent of the matter okay, that we are seeing. If I put that in the equation and say, and I impose it as a condition, and I say, what would be the cross section of that interaction if the relic density today is dark matter relic density? I find that that cross section is close to the Wick scale, exactly the scale at which the standard model has problems. Okay, connecting infinity to multi infinity. Okay, I'm doing only cosmological, uh, astronomical arguments based on just astronomy. Dark matter density and uh, and the expansion of the universe, and then I get the particle with the properties that are problematics of infinitesimal you know, physics, that is particle or field theory physics. So we call this these generic particles. We call them um, uh, weakly weakly interacting massive particles. Weeks. Okay. Question. Yes. How close is that match to the weak scale? How close? Is uh, it's going to 10 to minus 27 centimeters square. It is, it is close. It is very close. It's actually at least scale. It is. That's why we call it miracle of Wimps. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, it's, if you hear in the literature, they say Wimps miracle. Okay. What, so, three what is the level? Three levels. Yeah. Oh, so this is depending on what you, um, uh, uh, different cross sections you put. So if you put the smaller cross sections, if the cross sections are smaller, it takes longer, uh, no, very shorter. Uh, after the Big Bang, they just uh, fall off the equilibrium. If you, if the cross section is very large, then they, even if the universe cools off, they, they still see each other. So it, you're like the relic is, you know, and that's in between that you find the weak scale. So that's interesting. So maybe these are the particles. So we don't think about any model. Susie, Susie can give a good candidate for wimps, but we are not saying that. We say if there are wimps, they form actually a halo around the galaxy. And now I come back to, I think, your question about does it fall at some point, okay? No, it doesn't because the mass, this is the halo of mass, and the mass goes up and up and up, okay? There's no luminous matter here. If there was one, then I would see something fall off, okay? But it doesn't, okay? Because luminous matter stops here, the halo keeps going, okay? Has it been ruled out that dark matter could be made up of the particles we already know, some new ones or something like that? Or Baryonic dark matter, baryonic dark matter, there are other arguments, I don't want to go into detail, thanks for the question. There are other arguments uh, based on uh, light elements abundance. And because, you know, at the very beginning, <laughs> the only elements that were produced were like helium, hydrogen, you know, lithium. And then the distribution of these tell you, in particular the lithium, is very dependent on what would be the total uh, density of the baryonic, uh, baryonic matter. And it turns out that if you just look at the lithium distribution now, based on observation, okay, you, you are missing that. You know, it, it doesn't match. So basically, we say it can't be very young. So it can win. be, for example, there are other candidates here. So many, many candidates. Which is a very interesting and this particular subject that I'm working on. Okay, but there are many candidates. Like for example, you have heard about black holes. Okay, you know, very tiny black holes of the size of the Earth can be a candidate for dark matter. There are people who think about maybe, you know, ma matches, massive halo objects. And that again, there's a problem with baryonic because you know, we are talking about planet size, you know, objects in the universe. Or you are thinking about axioms. Or, you know. I have two questions. Um, sure. You show that the dark matter kind of fades off after that. Yes. Uh, to, to what is the extent of the dark matter? Yes, more. And the second question is, <coughs> just in the plane of the galaxy, or is it static? It is very homogeneous because it doesn't interact. It didn't have enough time to, to become like a planet because the interactions are very, very small. If you wait maybe another 200 billion years, they become like a planet. Like what is the extent? The extent of, uh, it is more or less curved, this one. You know, so the 10 times, it's going to drop off. It does drop off. It does drop off. It does drop off. It drop off and go to another galaxy. Is that the theoretical um, model or do they have any uh, physical measurements that? explain that, or confirm the cloud is like 10 times bigger than the galaxy. This is based on the observation. For the moment, you say that, uh, okay, if I see the, the velocity distribution, then that's the distribution of the uh, winds in the galaxy, and the mass distribution should be this. And you have a hard time to cut it off until you go farther and farther. Now, you can also look at the lensing. 
you can look at a very far object, like a cluster of galaxy, and see how far the lens is. And then you can estimate how far it is. And since the galaxy itself doesn't expand enough and give you matter that you can observe, then you would have to get this model from the interaction of galaxies when they go through one another. Uh, that that's the uh, the bullet cluster, but the bullet cluster is bullet clusters. That's, that's what. Okay, now wimps to our body. If what is the density of the wimps around us? If we think that it's about okay, 0.3 GeV in our in the vicinity of our solar system, our own solar system, the density of dark matter is about 0.3 GeV. Again, GeV is a giga electron volt. Electron volt is the energy of the electron uh, in a volt. And E equal MC square, you can equivalent, uh, you can find a unit for mass equivalent to energy, which is in GEV. So it's a 0.3 GEV per centimeter. <coughs> and that equals to about 1,000 beams at uh, each instant uh, is in your body. But because they are moving at 230 kilometers per second, which is about, about 1,000 times smaller than the speed of light, uh, they, about you know, uh, you know, a trillion of them are going through our body every second. How do we know how fast they move? We don't even know what they are and we cannot observe them. Because if you say uh, that if, if, if they're forming a halo, they have a temperature, okay? And they are having what we call a Boltzmann distribution, mm -hmm. you know, and then you can estimate what is the temperature so that could be what So dark matter has a temperature then? Sorry? Dark matter does have a temperature, means movement, right? Yes. So it has energy. It has energy in the way we know energy then? Yes, yes. It is like a, like a particle which is moving at a certain velocity. Okay, so but the main difference is we can't see it because it doesn't reflect light. And it has very weak interaction, weak scale. That's the problem. The cross section of interaction is very but small. In some ways, it's similar to the matter we know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's matter because of gravity. So is, is it the same as the CMB temperature? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, no, it can be the high, higher because now we are speaking about. The, uh, the, uh, no, it's not higher because its, uh, it's, it's, it's temperature is high by its own gravity. Okay? In, in mechanics, the energy, potential energy, and kinetic energy of a bound system, like our galaxy, like a structure, are in relation. Okay? So you can't have the, an energy, kinetic, field, uh, kinetic energy, is more or less temperature. But the CMB is a universe after expansion. This one is a very low pulse density. But let's think about the distribution of particles than temperature. You know, they are like uh, these particles, they clump together, okay, they form a structure, and now they take very long time for them to be equilibrium. So, me saying that they are in equilibrium is even, uh, uh, you know, they are for the moment, think about the spherical uh, clustering of this matter. You know, similar to what you have in the water condensation in the you know, just uh, things get colder, they just find each other and they come and then they come. But we can estimate what is the density of this matter, okay, of these uh, particles. Now, there are so many going through, and as the question was raised, so why we don't see them? Very, very small cross section. So, how they can interact, there are theories that predict their interaction, especially now it becomes a bit on the, depending on the theory you are choosing. Like on supersymmetry, you are expecting these interactions between the dark matter and um, and the nucleus of the, um, uh, uh, the normal material. Uh, uh, and depending on the interaction, they can deposit energy on the electron or on the nucleus. However, electrons are very light. The electron energy is one uh, is about 0.5 million electron volts. The mass of these particles we are looking for are about 60 billion electron volts, okay? So there's a huge difference in mass. And if you remember from cinematics, if you have two masses of very different, uh, two objects of very different mass, the transfer of energy from one to the other is very small. The transfer of energy is maximum when the two objects have zero mass. Interestingly, the nucleus of materials is about 60 GeV to GeV giga electron volts, billion electron volts. So the, the energy transfer from this particle to the nucleus is <laughs> And therefore, we are expecting, if there is any interaction, that interaction to happen with the nucleus of the material. Very rare, okay, and very little energy, 10 to minus 15 joules. Okay, we explained that. It's, okay, that was 
a slide I took from high school <laughs> to impress them. So it's 10 to minus 9 smaller than the energy of a mosquito hitting your skin, or in general, 1,000 times smaller than the energy that we are uh, dealing with in nuclear physics. So difficult experiment. You need to measure very, very tiny energies. Okay. But how we do? Like, for example, at Berkeley here in CD Minus, we're doing dark matter research. What we do, we take the crystals, okay, and we cool them to the very low, very, very low temperature. And by very low, I say minus 273 73 degrees Celsius, very close to the absolute zero, okay, or minus 416, so Fahrenheit. Uh, at these temperatures, the, basically the lattice vibration uh, stops. And a tiny interaction may cause a vibration that you can detect. Still, it's a very tiny energy. Okay? But if you have a very, like in this detector, this is a typical CDMS detector, okay, 600 gram germanium detector, ultra pure. And it's covered with the sensors, which are very, very sensitive. These are uh, uh, what are called transition A sensors. These are superconductors. I don't know how many of you know, know about superconductors. Superconductor resistance varies rapidly at certain temperatures, what we call phase transition. So if you bias your detector in that transition, in the middle of transition, a tiny amount, a tiny variation in temperature results in a big resistance value change, and then you can detect these tiny vibrations. So you basically measure the vibrations. That's what I call the listening to the sample. What we call phonons in solid state physics. Okay, in order to, to reach this very very low temperature, 10 millikelvin, zero absolute is when everything stops. You know, everything goes to a fundamental state. Okay, in order to reach that, what we use, you know, certain different apparatus like the dilution refrigerator, uh, the helium three helium four it mixes two isotopes of helium at liquid phase, and by mixing, they extract energy enough so that you go even below the, the, the condensation temperature of liquid he, uh, of helium. Okay, 4 Kelvin is helium. We go to 0 0.04 Kelvin. Okay, 0 0.010, 0 0.01 Kelvin, actually. So this is how we measure. So we can measure the energies as, as small. The problem, the other problem is that, again, coming back to that question, we are expecting very low interaction rate. We are expecting one event per 100 kilogram of material per year. That means that if I have 100 kilogram of detectors, basically my size, okay, it's, 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 it's the size of me, okay, and if I uh, let it go for one year, okay, I'm expecting only one interaction in that, okay? Now, just to give a typical, go ahead. If you see such a ringing signal, how do you know it was on cost? I get there. I get there. I get there. Just, you know, in five slides, I will be there, okay. Uh, uh, very low, and, but typical environmental activity is 10 billion per 100 kilograms per year. So I need to select one out of 10 billion, okay. So how can I do that? And many of these, uh, we have techniques developed to get rid of the ambient or let's say, you know, natural radioactivity. There is one problem, is the cosmic rays. Cosmic rays come from cosmos, the very high energy neurons that are coming from cosmos, and we need to somehow shield against that. And this is very hard to, to do shielding. But if you remember, I, I'm sure that the you know, crowd is old enough to have seen this movie, uh, Dr. Strange, as a you know, suggestion for you know, the doomsday machine, uh, what he suggested, that uh, somebody can tell me? Someone in the audience? What he suggested, you remember this the problem at the end, uh, uh, there was a uh, this uh, Russian. Uh, so he suggested Dr. Semenja just stand up and say we should go down underground, okay? <laughs> deep underground. And then there was all the story and the things coming after. And this is exactly what we do. We listen carefully to him. And this is the entrance of our lab. It is in Sudan, Minnesota, northern Minnesota. And this is I took you know specifically a picture of uh, of the shaft entrance at the, uh, during the winter. The temperatures can go as low as 40 below zero, you know, uh, on the surface. And then we take this shaft, uh, this elevator. Okay, we go down, and the first sign we see is this. So 2,341 feet below uh, the ground. Okay, or and uh, but this is not. Don't think about the cavities. You know that we go through and we just crawl through. No, it is not true. This is what we find there. <laughs> so, this is the cavity. There are many experiments running down underground, about uh, you know, 800 meters, 2,000. And this is not the the, the deepest uh, deepest um, uh, laboratory. 
the next step for CDMS, we are going twice deeper. We are going to about 2,000 meters underground in order to shield more against the uh, cosmic rays. And this is a, another experiment. This is not our experiment. This is another experiment. There's some artwork which is, you know, <laughs> I recommend you if you visit uh, Minnesota. First, it's a very nice vision during the summer, especially. And, uh, and uh, you visit the lab because our tours, and uh, there's this very nice artwork down there. Down there on the lab. <coughs> this is myself installing the detectors in the lab, okay? It's like a, uh, and uh, all the shieldings and so on. And now coming back to your question, what are the signatures? What, what we expect from this interaction? Two out of 100 billion, how, how can I make you believe that this is dark matter? Okay, so the thing is that these interactions should be the nucleus. Our detectors can distinguish between nuclear recoil, what we call, in interaction with the nucleus, and electron recoil, and that's how we distinguish the two. And the way we do it, we take our detector, not only we measure the vibrations in the crystal, we measure another parameter at the same time, which is ionization. Okay. So we measure ionization and uh, lattice vibrations, and we compare the two. It turns out that for nuclear recoil and electron recoil, recoil there are two distinguished uh, 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 population that grow, and uh, and our WIMPs interaction will fall in that in the in the region that we are in. The other thing is annual modulation of interaction. So the WIMPs are forming a halo around the galaxy, and the star is in the galaxy moving. Okay, the Earth is also moving around the Sun. So if you think about the Earth going around behind you know, the Sun, okay, at some point the velocity of uh, uh, the the, the Earth adds to the velocity of Sun. At some point, the velocity of the Earth uh, subtracts from the. Uh, okay, so you expect if this, if you think about uh, a halo, a, a cloud, or think about like walking in the, in the in the rain. If you run, you get more shower, uh, more uh, rain. If you uh, slow down, and that's the same thing. So you are looking at the rate of interactions, and if you see a modulation in the rate of interaction, okay, that's a very good signal. What we call the cosmological signature. There are other things, a diurnal uh, uh, modulation, that is to say, if I can uh, uh, detect the, uh, the direction of the recoil after interaction, between the day and night, there should be 180 degrees phase shift uh, between the, uh, 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 the direction of the recoil. So that's, uh, but for that, you need to have a lot of events. Already, it's 200 out of 100 billion. Now, for, in order to see modulation, you need to have a lots of events. I think you have a larger and larger experiments, okay, to increase the, uh, the probability of interaction, yes. Could your detector mm -hmm. also detect neutrino events? Yes. yes. And, and, yeah, and that's, that's our ultimate background. Oh, so that's the, the major background. No, that's, that's mean, the ultimate, I mean, underground. I mean. Uh, in the underground, detector, you can look at solar neutrinos. You know, at some point, if you go to the cross section of 10 to minus 48 centimeters squared, then you are sensitive. At the moment, I'm going to show you the plots of the, what are the current sensitivity in 10 to minus 40. But how do you differentiate them in neutrino and difficult? No way. Do they have the same periodic distribution as you would get from no. the or no. No. But then you have to run for a very long time. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't have that. Neutrinos are very fast. One of the questions maybe asked is why don't you think that neutrinos are dark matter? You know? Sure. Yeah. Well, the problem is the neutrinos are going to be very fast. It is so fast that you cannot imagine that they form galaxies. They, you know, you know, like, like the way, always think about water condensation in the clouds. Okay? So if you imagine the molecules of water are going so fast, they don't never see each other. Okay? So uh, they, they don't talk into, into uh, water drops. One question. Could you comment briefly on how you detect these photons? How you, where do they also detect So, uh, first off, this is an example. Our experiment is an example. There are many other techniques to take to the but in our particular case, so the phonons you measure basically what you do, you take a bulk of crystal. Let me go back to this quickly. I have time. Okay. So this this dot CRC, I don't know if it's visible. Uh, if you follow the lines, you see that they are kind of like a you know, wobbly. They are blobs there. Each one of those uh, is a tungsten transition edge sensor. This, the, the transition edge sensor is a superconductor. Okay? A superconductor in the middle of its transition. A superconductor uh, has a property that its resistance varies very rapidly with temperature. Okay? So if you bias it here, 
okay? A phonon, when it hits the surface, it just changes the temperature uh, of, the, of the sensor, so a tiny change in temperature makes it, and then we use squid amplifiers uh, to, to, to read, uh, to read the, 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 the small resistances out. Uh, so do you know, uh, and, uh, and then, okay, the other thing is, if you have multiple experiments, Okay, you have uh, an experiment with target like germanium, like we do, another experiment which uses, like, for example, sodium iodide, another uses liquid xenon. These are typical experiments in dark matter uh, uh, search. And then you look at the rate of interaction in different because because some particular thing with this interaction we call it coherent interaction in the, in the nucleus. It very much depends on the atomic number of the target material. Okay, the rate, expected rate. So if you see that it varies as you expect, you know, between target, different targets, the rates vary as you expect, there's an A square uh, function, and it follows, that's a very, very good. The problem again, the neutrinos can do the same thing, the question that you ask. Uh, but, you know, cosmological signature, okay, so here I think I explained that. This is an experiment who already claimed to, to observe the, the uh, modulation rate. It's a DAMA experiment based on sodium iodide in Italy, in another underground laboratory. They observed that over seven periods, and it is interesting that the phase of uh, change in the rate, the phase, and amp uh, the phase basically matches very well with what we expect with respect to Earth uh, and Sun uh, uh, orbit. But its amplitude is too large compared to the base rate. So this variation is of the order of few percent. What they are seeing is almost a full modulation. <coughs> it is interesting. And also, this event, okay, uh, it, the, 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 the rate they are expecting is already excluded by other experiments. As I said, you need to have multiple experiments. Two other, or three or more experiments already excluded the region they find dark matter in, the parameter space. But it is an interesting thing. You know, we are still studying, there is another experiment, a copy of that experiment going in the South Pole uh, to see if there is a, uh, uh, a relation between you know, being on the North Hemisphere or South Hemisphere, etc. It's, it's going on. It's very interesting, clear signal, we should understand this. So, and dark matter search is not only direct detection. Uh, the experiments I tried to uh, describe were all looking for interaction directly. Elastic interaction of the dark matter or the target. But you can also look, and there's another example, it's a liquid xenon, it's a noble gas, and uh, based on different, uh, another measurement. And you can also look for dark matter through the, uh, the products of their annihilation. Okay, if two dark matter particles, they collide each other, okay, they, they can annihilate and produce two photons, for example, of the same energy. You can look at the center of the galaxies or clusters or uh, uh, wherever you expect the density of dark matter to be greater. Okay, you can set your telescope there and look if there is a, a line, energy line that you are seeing coming from there. Some of the experiments, uh, uh, like the Fermi, uh, to some of the interpretation show that there is a line but then went away. Okay, so there is no convincing evidence for such an observation so far. The other thing is to create this. So one question you may ask is that these particles, can you create them in LHC? LHC is a particle accelerator in Switzerland, in um, uh, Geneva. And uh, can we produce them? Yes, we can produce them there, there too. But there you need to have a specific model, like SUSY, you know, supersymmetry. You produce particles there. And so far, there were no convincing alien uh, signal from uh, supersymmetry there. And we haven't found any convincing signals so far. So my final slide is actually the, uh, the what are the results. So here I need to explain what are these curves uh, mean. Uh, uh, each curve here, if you look at the curve, it actually is an exclusion. It tells you that anything about that, the y-axis is the cross-section of the hypothetical wing and the mass of the hypothetical wing on the x-axis. So it tells you that anything above this curve is excluded by this experiment. For example, see Mr. Germain, okay? WIMPs, if they exist, they can't have a mass of 100 
and cross-section of 10 to the minus 41. And now, you see, this curve excluded this region, but DAMA, the experiment that showed this modulation, is sitting right in the middle of excluded uh, space. And there are not only CDMS, there's Edelweiss experiment, which uses very similar, it's an experiment actually I did my PhD with, uh, in France. Uh, and you have also uh, experiments like uh, log, uh, Xenon, okay, that uh, excludes uh, Xenon 100, uh, 100, that exclude very well, you know, all, all those regions. Recently, uh, the CDMS experiment also claiming to uh, some abnormal background, okay, we have very, our very recent data shows that we have three events out of, again, uh, on million that are, look like a wimp interaction. So if you interpret them as a wimp signal, we, as a wimp candidate, they fall in this region, 10 minus 41, 10. Again, now, the cross-sections, look at the bottom of cross-sections, it's amazing, 10 to minus 45. Just, again, let me remind you, this, the, the cross-section of a nucleus, the, nucleus, the atom itself is 10 to minus 16. This is 10 to minus, we probe, Actually, 10 to minus 43, 10 to minus 41. Close. And we go on and go on, and the way you uh, increase your sensitivity is by increasing the mass of your detector. That is, you increase the probability of interaction, basically. So more atoms you have, more nucleus you have, more likely that the waves interact. And therefore, if you don't see anything, that means that your sensitivity goes down. So it can't be, the waves can't be at that cross section or so on. Uh, so with this, let me finish. Uh, uh, and if you have questions, uh, I can answer your questions. Okay. Yeah. So getting back to the, the question about Neutrino detection, would you see that orbital variation that typical orbital variation? No. no. You won't. Uh, you may see a little bit of difference depending on the how long will you uh, be patient to try and find one of these before you decide that the data? this is the right theory? Oh, how long will uh, you be patient in terms of waiting to see until, exactly until the convincing theory comes up? We look, we keep looking until we find uh, an answer. If there is a convincing theory or explanation comes up, we predict it power. Uh, that is, that they can suggest an experiment. Test. A testable theory, let's say. If it comes up, we stop there. And no, we can test that and the result will test positive. Otherwise, this is a very promising part, uh, let's say, candidate. Uh, as I said, it explains the physics at two scales. And uh, we keep going. You know, it's a, it's a, let me tell you, don't, don't get frustrated as I'm not frustrated. Because if you remember the CMB, the history of CMB, it is interesting with all the glory it has now. You know this fluctuation of the uh, of the density uh, uh, flux density of the photons. Uh, the very originally in 1970s they were expecting a fluctuation of the order of millikelvin. Okay, so it took 20 years to get to 10 to microkelvin, which was actual fluctuation, and that is has a very deep physical meaning for us. That means that everything that we are seeing today, our planet structures and so on, were coming from a very tiny quantum fluctuation at the very heart of the universe. And uh, that has a major uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 impact on our understanding. Um, are there any plans at CERN to follow up with this detection process and development? This detection process, they, can, they have to go underground. What they can do at CERN is to produce, try to make these particles, to create these particles. And yes, uh, the current, uh, at the moment, the total energy was about 70 tera electrons, and now they are infusing this 40 TeV. There are the probability of, uh, of uh, observing uh, supersymmetric particles increases, but we have to wait about three, four years. Any questions? So, what is a candidate for approaching this problem? Uh, what is the question? Are there other candidates? What is the candidate? What is the what is your favorite so we candidate? Yes, 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 yes. I mean, uh, uh, on the Susie, uh, it's easier to, to understand this because, you know, Susie explained also the problem with particles this year. And you know, this is what we're But, sorry, there's other things. There are other theories for dark matter. One of them is like asymmetric dark matter. Uh, 
And that mirror, the, the, the exponential volumes I gave you was based on the equilibrium that you can go through the structure and the fall down in your equilibrium structure. There are other explanations, like say, there is anti-matter and matter asymmetry, and if you want to impose that to the dark sector of the universe, then you get the masses of the waves of the order of 7 g called 7 g uh, uh, and that's another very, that's we call uh, asymmetry mirror. Okay, so that explains also why uh, matter and asymmetry. Why the universe is made out of matter, basically? Like we don't see any other galaxy out of matter. That's, that's another thing. And that can explain part of it. Is the DM particle its own kind of matter? It can, uh, no, uh, it can be, yes, it can be matter. Given that dark matter is somewhat elusive, how much more elusive is dark energy? <laughs> <laughs> We have detected something. We have detected that there is a kind of cancer. So it's elusive in a sense that it is very hard to see what it is. I don't see because it happens at the very larger scales. There are some ideas of experiments for dark energy, the vacuum energy, etc. Et but, uh, but, uh, but, but it is very difficult to measure, to detect. But you also expect that some other particles will eventually be responsible for yeah. dark energy. To give you an example, to give you an example, at the moment, if I just look at my particle physics and field theory and try to uh, find, you know, what is it? Vacuum expectation, you know, energy of the vacuum of these fields, if I add them together, and there is a hundred orders of magnitude difference between what <coughs> the dark energy should be and what you observe. Okay. Okay, so it's hard. I did make one question and then. Okay. We'll sure. wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Wimps related to the cosmic particles? They are cosmic particles. Are they, are they the same thing? They are not the same thing because cosmic particles actually uh, are, are uh, for us, are noise. We know them like muons. Okay, these are cosmic particles coming from Earth. Or very high energy gamma, high energy electrons. These ones we know. Wimps, they are coming from cosmos, but no, they are, they are very different. different. They're different. The higher energy. Yes, yes. Uh, the higher mass. Maybe the last question. Yeah, the question. No, it's fine.